Now we're going to talk about the process of actually fitting these ARIMA models and run through what's called the Box Jenkins method. So with the Box Jenkins method, we're going to be um, selecting a ARIMA model. So that's a model that has differencing here. That's the this part um, in the notation. That's how much differencing we have, and that's going to create the stationarity. And then once we have that transform stationary uh, data, we will then fit a ARMA model and select a ARMA model that's going to have your P component for the AR part and the Q for the MA. So first step is of this method, you evaluate stationarity, you do all the differencing that you need to create a transform time series that is stationary. Once you have that, then you're going to fit a, um, a ARMA model. And then, um, which is, has kind of two steps. First off, you need to select how much of the AR part you need and then how much of the moving average part. And then you're going to estimate the parameters for that. And the last step is doing your model checking. So let's kind of walk through this. I'm going to go and kind of show you, you know, kind of the nitty gritty of how you do this. But in practice and in the lab, you're going to be using the forecast package, which is going to do all this stuff for you. But I'm kind of showing you what forecast is doing for you so you can keep, kind of see underneath the hood. So first thing, what we need to do is we need to evaluate stationarity. And that's this idea that the time series is not changing in time, basically. It's kind of fluctuating around a level. That's the idea. So here's an example. This is just white noise. So just fluctuating there. But we can also have autocorrelated stationary processes, and this is what Mark showed you on Tuesday. So here's an example of RAR1. It's just fluctuating around a level. What does AR1 mean? What does that um, terminology mean? The one here. What this means is AR means that it's XT is a function of XT minus one. And the one is the number of lags we have in there. In this case, we just have one. So we just have XT minus one. If we had two, we would have x t minus two. Okay, so that's for AR. I'm not going to be showing the MA, but the MA, it's very similar, but we are modeling this part as a autoregressive model. So rather than the x t here, we are modeling this that way. Okay. So when we talk about stationarity, um, we, well, we, when you look at the test for stationarity, they will describe the stationarity as three different types. One, you have stationarity that's around a level of, uh, of zero. Level means this flat horizontal here. And it doesn't matter if it's like white noise or autoregressive. It's all going to be like that. Or we have the same thing, but the level is not zero. It's kind of hard to see here, but this is a little bit above zero. Same with this one. Looks like it's at zero, but actually it's, it's a little bit different. So we can also have a uh, fluctuating around a flat linear trend. So here's a linear trend against time. And we're just fluctuating around that. In this case, it's white noise around that. We can also have the same thing in, with a autoregressive stationary process fluctuating around this linear trend. So all of these would be considered stationary. And you look at this and say, hey, that's not stationary. It's, it's going up in time. But mathematically, it'd still be considered stationary because it's just fluctuating around a a linear trend. Mathematically, 
looks like this. Let's start with the white noise. So here's our white noise. So we started out with the plain white noise, which is this equals this independent errors. And then if we had it fluctuating a non -zero, around a non-zero mean, it would, we just add that to it. Around a linear trend, we add that plus that. With the AR, it looks about the same. We either we're adding this or we're adding that. The key thing is that this part here, with that there on the left, that's stationary. And when we talk about these three forms of stationary, it's just these three. Okay, so this is would be called a mean, and this would be called drift. Now let's look at non-stationarity. So the classic one we're going to be looking at is a random walk. And you saw those on Tuesday. Here's one. And if we simulate a whole bunch of these like that, you can see it's getting wider and wider. It's not like the other ones. It's not just fluctuating around a level. It's They're actually kind of changing over time, getting wider here. In the same way that we have a, and I showed that random walk. So here's the random walk here, right here. It's just this equals that plus that. That's your random walk. There's no phi term there. In the same way that we had the non-zero mean and the linear tre um, trend, we could sort of mathematically, we can add these. They, you'll see they don't turn out to be linear trends. But we can add that, that term there, that mean, or we could add um, the a times t there. Let's see what that does. So when we do that to a random walk, we just add those terms. It behaves really differently. So here, here's a random walk, right? This one's stationary. If we add that non-zero mean, all it does for this one is it sort of shifts it up or down. If we add that to a random walk, we start getting this uh, uh, increase or decrease. We, we add this trend. Okay, I see that in this one, it's not really obvious that it looks here like this is a trend. So I think I, I would have needed to simulate this a lot longer. And if I had done that, what you would see is that this, this one is, is kind of going up more than this one. So, or, or if I had simulated a whole bunch of these, what you would see is they'd kind of be like going wider like that. But if with this one, with a trend, it's, it's also spreading out, but it's, it's going up at the same time. If we add that, um, that AT term to it, then it's really different. It comes, comes this kind of explosive thing. It's going up um, exponentially. Okay. So I point this out because if you use the test for stationarity, they're going to talk about these different types of stationarity. In practice, you're going to be using the forecast package in the lab. It's going to take care of the subtleties. I'm just going to be showing you what's happening behind, underneath the hood. So now let's say we want to test, we, we need to test for stationarity. So why is that important? Today, for this lecture, we're using the box Jenkin methods for forecasting. And the step one of doing that is creating a transformed stationary time series that we can fit a ARMA model to. So for this lecture, the reason we need to evaluate that is we need to do enough differencing until our time series is stationary. So that's why we're testing for Box Jenkins. Now, in other types of data analysis, there are reasons you want to test for stationarity. So first off, maybe you are fitting an ARMA model. Well. A lot of the algorithms do assume station, stationarity. Now, technically speaking, you could fit a uh, 
an ARMA model to non-stationary data, but you need to use an algorithm that can deal with non-stationarity. Any of the standard ones just assume that it's stationary. Um, another reason is maybe you're fitting a stationary model to your data. There's lots of models that you're fitting um, say it's in the literature, it's a particular type of model you're fitting, and it is by nature a stationary model. Well, if your data are not stationary, you are trying to fit a model that's fundamentally inconsistent with your data, and you don't want to do that. And lastly, many processes in environmental science are fundamentally random walks. So like movement, population growth, genetic drift. So non-stationarity is something that we're typically going to be faced with with our data and we we need to be aware of that and sometimes we need to test for that so how do we test for it first thing you always want to do is just take a look at your data so the visual test and then i'll talk about two quantitative tests so visual test well what are you actually looking for basically you want to look is the level is the mean of it changing over time um, does it is it increasing decreasing has little wiggles at it that sort of thing you also want to look does it appear that the variance is changing over time okay so let's look at some data here are these anchovy and sardine catch data that i'll be using in this lecture and so just right off the bat, you kind of see, ah, oh, sardines look kind of okay, but there's definitely something going on here with the anchovy. It's possible you could say it's fluctuating around a, um, a linear trend, although even there, to me, it looks like it's, it's kind of like got a little bit of a, a swoop to it. Okay, so suggest that the anchovy has some a non-stationarity that we need to deal with. We need to do some differencing to fix that up. Okay, so that was our visual test. The There are two main um, or quantitative tests that we do. The first one's called the Dickey-Fuller test or the augmented Dickey-Fuller test. And this one is looking for evidence that the time series has a random walk in it. The null hypothesis of this test is that the time series does have a random walk. So a unit root is what it's called. It has some random walk component. And the alternative hypothesis is that it is some variation of stationarity. When I say some variation, remember I showed you those three variants of stationarity saying it has one of those three. So here are the three um, variants of the dickey voller test. So first one would be stationary around a zero mean. The second one would allow for the mean to be non-zero, so this level to mean non-zero. And the last one would um, allow this linear trend. And it's going to be testing these against these random walks that look like this. So these are the, um, so this would be your um, alternative, and this is your null for each of these. In R, there are two main ways that we can do this. Um, the T series is a, a nice test. It's, it's a bit simpler, but it also is not as flexible. So this one, it is always going to be using this test down here. It's kind of your, your most kind of complex version. Like it's most flexible, let's put it that way. Most flexible. It's going to allow both this constant and it's going to allow a trend. So, so here it allows both of them. And for what I'm going to be showing today, I'm going to set this k equals zero and um, 
that. Uh, what is that? Let's describe what that's doing for you here. So. All the way back here. So remember when I was talking about these AR and I was talking about the stationarity and I showed it with lag one. Well, um, for the Dickey Fuller, if you set the K equals to zero, it's it's fitting something that looks kind of like this. But you could say that you could have a more complex stationarity, so you have have more lags in there. For the examples for the lecture, I'm just kind of simplifying it, so setting that, so it's just it's not a more complicated stationarity test. All right, so um, here we go for those anchovies. We know it it has a trend in there, and what you see here, here's the alternative hypothesis. It's stationary. We would like to reject the null. And you could see at the 0.05 level, it's we're weekly, we're not rejecting it. So that's not good. So that's not what we want. As I said, there are these three different types of stationarity. And there is another test that you can use in R, another package. And it's called this, it's this package here. And this is the test. Um, this is standing for Dickey Fuller. And in this version, you have a lot more control over it. So you can select the type and be specific to either none, you have that mean, or you have that linear trend. So like that. But um, kind of deciphering the output of that test is um, uh, it's not intuitive to say the least. I put a few slides in here, um, kind of for the record, if you ever had to do this, you could look it up, but I'm not expecting you to actually um, do this, this test directly. The forecast package, um, we'll be using um, this because it, I'll describe how it needs to have access to this fine, fine, finer control of the stationarity test. So anyhow, blah, blah, blah. This is all the stuff just to be able to interpret the output from that test. You can see it's kind of painful. Okay, so let's go to the next test. This is a KPSS test. And this one, the null hypothesis is that the time series is stationary. So it's op opposite to the Dickey Fuller. And um, the alternative is that it's has well the alternative that it's not not stationary so some kind of random walk so for this one this again with the t-series package here's our null and we have these two options here so this first one is that the um, it's fluctuating around this horizontal level and then the second one is that it's fluctuating around a linear trend. Okay, so um, if you really care um, to make sure it's absolutely, you know, satisfies the stationarity assumption, you would want to be able to pass both of these tests. Although you'll see, well, I'll show you in a moment with the, the indifs, we tend to use just one test. Okay. Uh, indifs is a function that's in the forecast package. So let's do the KPSS test with the anchovy data. And here's how we do it, like that, anchovy. And I'm going to set the null to uh, trend because we saw that it was kind of going upward. We'd like to test if it's still stationary just around a linear trend. And do that. And here, we would like to reject, well, no, we um, we don't want to reject the null. For this one, the null is that it's stationary. And you can see, even allowing for that trend, um, it's still rejecting the null. So here it's saying that this anchovy time series is non-stationary. 
So even though we saw that, that, that trend upward and it looked like maybe it was kind of linear, it's still not passing a stationarity test where we say that it's stationary around a linear trend. So we're going to need to do something. So how do we fix these stationarity problems for the Box Jenkins method? So when we're using ARIMA models, we do differencing, and that is the I in ARIMA, is that differencing. So how do we, do we difference, or what is a difference? A difference is basically we take the data at time t and we subtract the data at time t minus 1. So that's called a first difference. In R, we use the diff function. The second difference is just the difference of the first difference. So the second difference, so if this is the first difference, if zt is the first difference, then the second difference is zt minus zt minus 1. So let's see how differencing can make our data, our time series, stationary. So here's the anchovy. I'm just kind of going up here. We take the first difference, and nice. OK, that looks much better. Let's test it. So uh, we're going to do the KPS uh, test. And we don't want to reject the null in this case because um, the null hypothesis for this one is that it's stationary. So do the KPSS test on this first difference. Great. Was not rejected. That's good. OK. So let's try out the ADF test. So remember, you know, I told you that this test from in the T-series package, it is using that most complex stationarity test that we have both the constant and the trend. So, but let's just go ahead and use that. So we're going to try that on the difference. And so the alternative is stationary. So we would like to reject the null. Ah, we didn't reject the null. So that's kind of interesting, right? Like we looked at the data, it looked like it looked all right. And the KPS test said, yeah, it's all right. Well, you know, when we did that first difference, we got rid of that trend. So if we are applying the ADF test to first difference data, we shouldn't be using a stationarity test that has a linear trend in it. We should be using the one that just has the um, level on it, so the horizontal level. So let's try this out with this one. And we're just, let's see here. Yeah, go back to the Urca one. Sorry. So with the, with this test, so this one is one, it doesn't have any kind of, um, anything to it. It's just fluctuating around a zero level. This one is the one we've just got this kind of mean horizontal level, so up or down. And then trend, it's going up with, um, with time. So if we do our first difference, we, we've gotten rid of this, so we should step back one. Okay. So now let's go back here. So that's why I picked this, because I did a first difference. Um, if I did the second difference, then I would go back one again, so I wouldn't have this there. I wouldn't have that mean there, because that second difference would also get rid of that mean level. So that's why when you're using this particular test, you need to know how much differencing you've applied to your data. And the long and the short of this is that 
if you use the right um, augmented Dickey-Fuller test, you would reject the, um, the null hypothesis of stationarity. Okay, so that's a lot to remember, right? So fortunately, the forecast package will take care of this for you. So um, this function here calculates the number of differences you need to apply to your time series to make it stationary. And you can choose the test. It'll uh, use uh, three different tests. You can use the KPSS. You can use the augmented Dickey-Fuller. And it also has a third one. I'm just going to show these. And you can see that for both of these, it's showing that we need one, um, one difference. So we use the first difference. And so notice here that when I use this test, it's showing one here and one there. So what's going on here is that forecast knows that um, you know, it's calculating the first difference. So when it when it tests using the augmented Dickey Fuller on the first difference, it knows to not include that trend. And if you were doing the second, if you did the second difference, it would get rid of the mean level also. So it's doing that for you. It knows which one it needs to use. Okay. So um, summary stationarity test. So first one is your visual test. Just take a look at it. And then uh, after that, you um, apply a unit root, root test. And a good way to do that is using the this indifs. And you can try the different, um, different tests and see the amount of differencing. So what you would like is that it comes up with the same amount of differencing for all of them, if it kind of jumps up, like if this one's one and this one's two, that kind of tells you that mm, one, one, the first difference might be a little bit borderline. And, um, you know, it's kind of a borderline between needing one and, and two differences. So, so if it's failing one of them, try a, a second difference. Or sometimes you, um, you might actually have to do something a little more complicated. And if it's still not passing, well, that is really kind of, um, uh, that's kind of bad. Um, take a look at your data. It should be obvious that there's something really weird going on with your, your data. Okay. So. Now we have uh, figured out the level of differencing that we need. Next thing, what do we do? So now we need to fit the ARMA model to our transformed data, to our data that has been differenced. On Tuesday, Mark talked about using the ACF and PACF to visually infer them. However, in practice, when we're fitting these, we um, we use model selection. So we kind of use this to understand our data. It's definitely good to do this to see if there's anything strange going on with them. But then when you're actually picking the model, we use model selection. And the basic idea is that you fit a whole bunch of models and you use some model selection criteria to fit the best one. Fortunately, in the forecast package, the auto ARIMA function will do all this for you. So let's see how the auto, uh, the output for the auto ARIMA would look if we're doing this for the anchovy. So we're going to pass in the anchovy to it, say auto ARIMA. And what it is saying is just to do a first difference. And then we have some um, uh, autocorrelated error on it. That's what that MA is. This is talking, this, the MA part is our error part. 
Okay. And then the with drift part, um, as I say here, it means that the mean of the anchovy first difference is not zero. And when you do a first difference and you have drift, what that is telling you is that your, your data are going upward like those uh, anchovy data. It can be um, just sort of a, in practice that it can be hard in my um, experience just being able to read that and know what those data look like. I can now because, you know, I've worked a lot with these models, so I recognize that. But I think when you're beginning, what is helpful is to simulate the data and take a look at it. So you, you use a, you fit something and then you're going to use a REMA sim and simulate from that so you can see what it looks like. Okay. So as I said, what Auto Arima is doing is that it's fitting a bunch of models and then it is selecting one based on some information criteria. What it's using by default, by default here is AI, AICC, which is this um, corrected AICC for a small sample size. You can change that though. You can do different criteria, so you can play around with that. If you want to see the models that it fit, you can pass in trace equals true. So you can do that. And you can see um, what it's fitting. Now, I use this um, as an example because you can see here that this has some uh, inf in here. And if you are. Um, So like for the lab, like you wouldn't want to dig into this harder, but if you're using this like in a real analysis, you would want to um, actually go and kind of dig into the, these, these imps here. Sometimes they're real, sometimes something happened and um, there's actually a, an actual value for the AICC and you could get that if you like try to fit that model directly. Okay, the, that's just kind of details, just thinking, you know, if you are, you know, using that um, in practice, don't, don't worry about it for the lab. So in this case, um, as I said right here, let's look at this. This is the model that it selected. And let's write that out mathematically. This is what it is. So it's saying this first difference here is a model where we have this moving average, and I told you that's the error here. So that error, this is the error here, that error there is autocorrelated. That's what that means, okay? It's autocorrelated. Includes both this value here and the previous value. And it also has a mean to it. So let's, um, let's now try using auto arima with some simulated data so we know what the the truth is and let's see how it does so we're going to simulate with arima sim and it what does it take it takes the number of time steps and then it also takes the model and we pass that in as a list and we pass in the ar part and we could also pass in the ma part but i'm not going to do that um, so it would be the same. It would be MA equals, you know, however many um, lags. So in this case, we're just doing the AR, and we have the first fee, and then this is the second fee. And did I write down? Oh, okay. Okay. In um, when we meet on the in, in person, I will write down what this is mathematically. So basically we've got, it's, it is the um, X uh, T at time T equals 0.8 times X at time T minus one 
plus 0.1 times x at time t minus 2 plus some error. So that's the model. It has these two lags in it. And this is some simulated data from that. And now we can fit this to that simulated data. And to make things a little easier for AutoArima, I um, am going to tell it, don't do any differencing. I just want you to try to fit a, um, basically an ARMA model because I'm setting, I'm saying no differencing. So I, I'm basically getting rid of that. Okay, so how does it do uh, if, to the simulated data? So what it estimates is that the best model is, it's the right form, right? It's just got AR. It doesn't have any MA in it. Well, that's good. Um, but it says that I only have one lag here. So I only have X at time T minus one in there. I don't also have the X at T minus two. And, um, okay, I guess that's not terrible. All right. Um, it also has a mean in there. Okay. Well, there wasn't a mean. You see, I didn't put a mean in here. Um, but it had it in there. Okay. So key thing here is that it's choosing this AR1. It's not an AR2. So let's do 100 simulations of this and see how it does. So I'm just going to run this little simulation. And this these kinds of simulations are really, really great for you to understand how um, how your proposed method for analyzing some data, how, how well that works. So we do these kind of little simulations all the time so, to understand what our, how our proposed method might work. So here, I'm just setting this up, I'm saving all those fits. And then, how am I saving them? I'm saving it as some text where I am um, looking at that fit, and this one is the number of the, the lags, and this is the number of the MAs. So this is the number of the AR lags, the first number is, and the second number is going to be the MA lags. What I want is I want 2 hyphen 0. So let's see how it does. So here's all the fits. So out of those 100, 74 times it picked an AR1, 20 times it picked an AR2, and then um, every so often it picked e even more complex ones. But it never included any MA components, so that, that's good. So it was getting the right class, but it tends to choose overwhelmingly a simpler AR model than the true uh, AR2 model. Okay, so this is just a point that when um, auto arima is being used, it is um, sort of to speed things up, it's using an approximation. And when you are doing your final fit, you want to turn that approximation off. So you just say approximation false, um, and uh, you also want to turn off the uh, stepwise. So that, it's going to take longer, but it's going to fit to a much larger set of models, and you might find a model that is uh, better, as in has a smaller delta AIC, than if you use the approximation and use the stepwise one. Okay. So, summary, um, you can use auto arima, just, you know, just use it and not like poke into your data with ACF and PACF to fit your models, but it's always good to do these kind of visual diagnostics by running these two functions on your data just to understand it better and to make sure that what is coming out of the best estimated model with auto arima does match what you're seeing with these two visual um, sort of diagnostics. Okay.
So, last bit, model checking. What are the kinds of model checks that we do um, when we're using the Box Jenkins method? So, um, th this is, you know, checking the residuals is something we do whenever we're fitting models. It's a basic test that we do. And the residual is the difference between the expected value of um, x at time t and the data. Now, in an ARMA model, there's actually no observation error. So the expected value is the expected value from the data up to time t minus 1. This is, um, I mean, it may seem kind of like a technicality, but later we're going to be talking with about state space models that do have observation error. And when we talk about that class of model, then we have kind of two types of residuals. We have the um, residual that is representing our observation error, and then we also have this kind of same type of residual as in the ARMA, which is the difference between XT, X, XT that we observe and what we would expect given the data up to time T minus 1. So these, these kind of residuals are kind of what's it's called one step ahead residuals. Okay. So... Whenever you're working with fits, you're going to be using what's um, what's called the residuals function. Basically, all fits that you use, whatever like types of fits that you use, they're going to have a residuals method. So you just run residuals on your fit. So from the forecast package, it returns this forecast object. You say residuals on that, and there you go. These are your one step ahead residuals. If you wanted the um, expected values, so you wanted that forecast, the functions you would use for that is the fitted function. And residuals then would be the difference between your data and fitted. So if you just took the difference there, you would get what's coming out of residuals. So, standard residuals test. First thing, just plot them. They should look roughly like white noise. Second, look at the autocorrelation function, the ACF function. They should be uncorrelated. And lastly, look at the histogram. So, um, normality is a common error assumption, and if that is the error assumption, then they should look roughly normal. The forecast package has a nice function called check residuals. It will do these three tests for you. So here we go. That the top is your visual test. It doesn't look too bad. The bottom left corner is your ACF, your autocorrelation test looks good. Um, it's all between these dotted lines. And then our histogram, well, it's kind of hard to say. There's not all that much data here. So, mm, yeah, who knows. If you, uh, if you do this and you said plot false, so, you know, you weren't doing this visual test here, and if you said plot false, what it will give you is a quantitative test, and this is the kind of the, the classic test that is done, and you, um, so in this test, the null hypothesis is no autocorrelation, so we don't want to reject the null for this one. And you can see here, we do not reject the null, so that's good. So that would say we do not have autocorrelation. All right, so 
that's just your kind of whirlwind tour of using the Box Jenkins method. As I said, we're going to be using the forecast package, which makes all this uh, really quite easy for us.